He was a young man so upset at his lack of companionship with women that he decided to kill them all instead. And although his day of retribution didn't quite go to plan, he would leave behind grieving families and a long, digital trail of clues to his destruction. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Elliot Roger, who was also known as the Killer Virgin, King of the Incels, or as he liked to call himself, the Supreme Gentleman. It's been a long time that I've wanted to cover this case. In this video today, we'll be looking at Elliot's history, tying his video logs to his stories, and looking at what eventually led him down his darkest path. I do also have a small announcement to share with you all at the end of this video, but first, I have a story to tell. So without further ado, pull up a seat, grab a coffee and sit back. This is the case of Elliot Roger. The story of Elliot Roger first begins east of the Atlantic Ocean in London, England. Elliot was born on the 24th of July 1991. His father, Peter Roger, was a British filmmaker and photographer, and his mother, Lee Chin, was a nurse who worked on film sets. It's through their encounters at work that the two first found love before conceiving Elliot two years later. His parents also had a daughter, Elliot's younger sister was called Georgia. When Elliot was the age of five, the family moved to Los Angeles, California in 1996, and this was a move to strengthen his father's career in filmmaking. After settling into their new home, Elliot was enrolled into Topanga Elementary School. By all standards, he was a well-behaved kid, even making a few friends in his first year. His childhood seemingly bright and positive. But it was just after his seventh birthday that his first struggle in life appeared. His mother and father would unfortunately divorce, and this would leave both him and Georgia to split their time between the two on weekdays and weekends. Elliot was already described as a shy and quiet person. He was happy, but didn't have much confidence, and he would always try to fit in with the cool kids. A sudden change in his home life, though, would propel his insecurities. Two months after his seventh birthday, his father Peter would introduce Elliot to a new woman, and her name was Sumaya Akabun. She moved into Elliot's father's household shortly after, and before he knew it, Elliot realised that she was now his new stepmother. The two would argue often, and with Elliot not accepting any discipline from an outsider, this would be a recurring problem in the years to come. Elliot lived a relatively wealthy life growing up. He went on several holidays abroad, had access to general and mental health care, and pretty much got whatever he wanted. But despite the money and gadgets that Elliot owned, his friendship circle slowly dwindled into his teenage years, and he eventually found himself becoming the target of frequent bullying. He still had friends, but not many. The situation would grow more complicated at home too. At the age of 13, Elliot's father and stepmother had a son. Elliot's new stepbrother was called Jazz. In his mid-teens, he started a personal YouTube account called Elliot's Blog which is where he often complained about his loneliness and reminisced about his childhood. Elliot Roger here, and here I am at Serrania Park. <sighs> the most significant place of my childhood. It was around this time that Elliot began his path of depression and loneliness. Unfortunately, the bullying at school didn't stop for Elliot either. Even at one point, the teasing resorting in Elliot having his head taped to the desk by fellow classmates. It was through negative encounters like this that caused Elliot to move from school to school quite often, and with that, he never made any friends locally. Elliot also started to see a psychiatrist at the age of 16. He was prescribed Risperidone, an antipsychotic used to treat schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. He openly admitted in his blogs though that he refused to take this medication. After turning 18, Elliot became increasingly isolated, by now, he only had a handful of online friends. He often told his parents that he was unable to make friends in real life, and no girls ever seemed interested in talking to him. Elliot decided that he wanted to improve his life moving forward, and to do this he would try two things. The first one was to learn how to drive, thinking that this would impress women, and the second would be to try and dress better, therefore making him seem more approachable. He desperately wanted to fit into the world and make friends, so along with his new car, he changed his hairstyle and brought a bunch of new clothes. It was noted by his classmates, however, that although he did buy a new car and new clothes, he never actually tried to speak to anyone or make any friends. 
Instead, he would sit in his car on lunch breaks, and expect others to make the first move. His evenings and weekends still continued to be spent alone at home as well. He would spend his time either playing World of Warcraft or Halo with his three friends James, Philip, and Addison. And more or less, at the age of 18, Elliot recognised that he had spent most of his latter teenage years angry at the world. Upset that he didn't fit in with friendship groups, despite never trying to. And even more importantly to him, he started to become enraged that he had never slept with or even had a girlfriend for that matter. Elliot's perspective on other people had shifted to become more toxic too. He openly admitted in his journal that whenever he saw a couple together, holding hands or kissing, he would feel either intense sadness or rage. At one point, this resorted in Elliot throwing hot coffee over a couple that he saw kissing in a Starbucks car park. And while that action seemed hostile and completely out of order, it was only going to get worse. In the year of 2011, Elliot was 19, and on Saturday the 4th of June, he moved to Isla Vista, a community on the coast of Santa Barbara, California. He moved there to attend Santa Barbara City College, joining a private residence with two other men. It was almost instantaneous that Elliot's bitterness and loneliness extended into his new life though. Within a week he was frustrated with his housemates, and by the end of the month, they had moved out. The situation with Elliot's next pair of housemates though was even worse, and coupled with Elliot's racism, he would argue with the two daily, almost getting into physical fights on a couple occasions. The longing for a girlfriend continued too. He would often get so angry at seeing couples that it would become a normality for him to run back to his room, sulking and crying. His life continued to worsen in 2012 too. It was this year that he dropped out of all of his classes altogether, not being able to stand the sight of others falling in love. Elliot also spiralled into the trap of gambling with lottery tickets. He believed that getting rich by winning the lottery would give him all of the female attention that he desired, and so in the first week of February 2012, he spent over $100 on lottery tickets. Not surprisingly, he didn't win. The next week though he felt more confident, and so he spent $500 on lottery tickets. No dice, but maybe third time's the charm? Week 3, he spent $700. This too though, ended in a loss. He had nothing to show for the $1,300 he spent gambling. And even worse, he didn't accept defeat. He felt like he deserved it, that he was cheated away from his money. Elliot dipped into one of the worst bouts of depression in his life shortly after this. As spring break flared up in Isla Vista, he spent most of his time in his room, refusing to try and socialise. Angry, sad, and alone. And for the times that he did leave his house, he'd walk by himself, ranting to his video camera about his life. Hey, Elliot Roger here. Right now I'm just taking a walk through the park in this really nice, secluded area. I'm just contemplating about my life and how unfair it's been lately. Ever since I started desiring girls, but they never desired me back. Life has been a living hell since then. Right now it's spring break. Everyone else my age is out having fun with their friends and their girlfriends. Here I am, taking lonely walks through a park. In April 2012, Elliot's long-term childhood friend James also decided that enough was enough. He found Elliot too radical, too negative, and so with that said and done, he called the friendship off. It was at this point that Elliot now considered himself entirely alone, friendless in this cold world. Late one September night, Elliot drank an entire bottle of wine, or at least he tried to, he ended up spilling an entire glass all over his laptop, completely destroying it. This meant that the next day he had to go to Best Buy to buy himself a brand new one. While he was there, he had to wait a few hours for the store to prepare his order, and so during that time, he walked across the road to a local firing range. This would be a turning moment for Elliot. He had previous thoughts of acting out the Day of Retribution, a time where Elliot would claim vengeance against women for denying him of his sex life. And it was here in this firing range, after he took his first few shots, that he asked himself, What am I doing here? How could things have led to this? While his internal question at first sounded hesitant, by the end of the day, he had made his mind up. He had come to the conclusion that humans are just brutal animals, and if he cannot thrive among them, he would have to destroy them all. 
In his manifesto after this day, he wrote, I didn't want things to turn out this way. I wanted a happy, healthy life of love and sex. But if I'm unable to have such a life, then I will have no choice but to exact revenge on the society that denied it to me. Elliot purchased a Glock 34 automatic pistol in December that year, and again during the following spring break he purchased another firearm, a 6 hour P226. On the 20th of July 2013, Elliot attended a party where he again tried to interact with girls. He'd been working out in his bedroom for the previous two weeks, and he thought that this would increase his chances. But again, it ended in him being ignored. In his drunk state, he sat on a 10-foot ledge where other members of the party were hanging out. This escalated into an argument where he then tried to push girls off that very same ledge. He failed, and instead he was pushed off the ledge by the men who had intervened. This resulted in Elliot being beaten up, and eventually he would need surgery to repair his broken left leg. This, according to Elliot in his manifesto, is what actually made him start meticulously planning his day of retribution. But with a broken leg and some preparations to make, it would take some time. Fast forward and it is now the early months of 2014. In those early months, which would be the final months before the planned attack, Elliot spent most of his days outside of his room. He went on hikes in the mountains of Montecito, took long strolls along the beach, wandered to the parks around Santa Barbara, and watched the sunset in many car parks as he contemplated his own existence. Hey, Elliot Roger here. I'm just sitting in my car right now, after watching that beautiful sunset descend beyond that hill up there, enjoying a nice vanilla latte. I've been doing a lot of thinking about how sad and unfair my life has been, all because girls haven't been attracted to me. I've had to rot in bleak and sad loneliness. I mean, you give a chance to all these stupid, obnoxious guys and I see, and I see you walking with, but you don't give a chance to me. Why not? I'm, I'm such a magnificent guy. I'm beautiful. You can't deny that. I'm civilized, intelligent, sophisticated. I have a sense of style, and yet you girls don't see it. It's, it's not fair. I deserve them more. I don't understand you girls. It's like your sexual attraction is flawed. It's perverted. This world is so twisted. But anywhere he went, he would see couples together, and this outraged Elliot. During this time, he would record himself in and around his car. He would upload these videos to YouTube, but no one would pay attention to them. Hey, Elliot Roger here. I'm just sitting in my car right now, enjoying the view of the beach. And my view has been ruined by this sight right here. In front of me, sitting right there on that bench, is a young couple. I was enjoying such a nice view until they came and sat down and started kissing. This is the reason why life isn't fair. Why can't I experience something like that? I have to show everyone why I hate the world. Because no girl would do this with me. I hate them. I hate them so much. It's not fair. Life is not fair. Only one week had passed since that video had been uploaded to YouTube when police came knocking on Elliot's door. Someone had watched the video and they were suspicious that Elliot was unstable. They called a health agency, which in response called the police, and they in response went to him. Police interrogated Elliot outside of his bedroom door, questioning him on if he had any suicidal thoughts. He played the situation down though and said that he was doing just fine. It was a very close call because if police did go into Elliot's bedroom, they not only would have found his pistols and a plethora of ammunition, but they would have also found his manifesto too. Unfortunately though, 
they never entered Elliot's bedroom. Elliot's radicalised thoughts were at this stage solidified, and the severity of his emotions were only getting worse. Hey, Elliot Roger here. I'm up in the hills in Montecito right now. It's truly a beautiful day. But, as I've always said, a beautiful environment is the darkest hell if you have to experience it all alone. And sadly, I've been alone for a very long time. And my problem is girls. I don't know why you girls are so repulsed by me. I dress nice. I'm sophisticated. I'm magnificent. I have a nice car. A BMW. I'm polite. I'm the ultimate gentleman. Look at how fabulous I look. And yet, you girls, you never give me a chance. And that's just such an injustice because I'm so magnificent. I deserve girls much more than all those slobs I see at my college who are somehow able to walk around with beautiful girls. I mean, look at me. I'm gorgeous. But you girls don't see it. I should be the one with the girls. But you never give me a chance. It's such an injustice. I don't know why you girls hate me so much. I've always wished I could ask you this, and this is my way of asking you this. This is the only way I can ask you. Elliot's plans for the Day of Retribution were complicated and violent. The day was actually spread across two. He planned to first drive to his father's house where he would kill his stepmother and his younger brother, Jazz. He was always frustrated with Samaya, and so for him it would be sweet revenge. And as for Jazz, he didn't want his younger brother surpassing him as a man, so he too had to go. He would only do this if his father was out of town for the week though, he didn't want to harm Peter. Next, he would drive back to Ila Vista with the family SUV, and take the lives of his housemates so he could use the apartment as a place to lure strangers in before beating and killing them. George Chen and Cheng Yuan Hong were currently living with Roger in their shared school apartment. He would then on day two target the Alpha Phi sorority, a sorority he deemed as the most beautiful dorm on campus, filled with hot blonde girls. After he was done with them, he would then switch to his SUV and head over to Del Player, before running over as many victims as possible, and then turning the gun on himself. Elliot Roger saw himself as a god, deserving of much more than he had on planet Earth. In the final pages of his manifesto, he wrote, I am Elliot Roger. Magnificent, glorious, supreme, eminent, divine. I am the closest thing there is to a living god. Humanity is a disgusting, depraved, and evil species. It is my purpose to punish them all. I will purify the world of everything that is wrong with it. On the day of retribution, I will truly be a powerful god, punishing everyone I deem to be impure and depraved. His preparations for the day of retribution wouldn't quite go to plan though. His plans for day one to execute his stepbrother and stepmother would require his father to be out of town, and while he originally did have plans to do so, that was cancelled last minute. The consequence to this is that Peter actually and unknowingly saved his wife's and his son's lives just by being home. As a result, Elliot ditched his plans for the SUV too. His BMW would have to do, but before he could execute the rest of his plans, he would have to make and upload one final video to YouTube. Hi, Elliot Roger here. Well, this is my last video. It all has to come to this. Tomorrow is the day of retribution. The day in which I will have my revenge against humanity. Against all of you. I'm 22 years old and I'm still a virgin. And it has been very torturous. It's not fair. You girls have never been attracted to me. I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you all for it. I don't know what you don't see in me. I'm the perfect guy. 
and yet you throw yourselves at all these obnoxious men. Instead of me, the supreme gentleman, I will punish all of you for it. You will finally see that I am, in truth, the superior one, the true alpha male. <laughs> Yes. Well, now I will be a god compared to you. You will all be animals. You denied me a happy life. And in turn, I will deny all of you life. It's only fair. I hate all of you. <laughs> I've waited a long time for this. I can't wait to give you exactly what you deserve. Utter annihilation. <laughs> On the 23rd of May 2014, Elliot began his rampage. He started by stabbing his two housemates, George Chen and Cheng Yang Hong, to death. Their friend Wei Han Wang was visiting at the time, and he too was killed. The three men receiving 142 stab wounds between each other. At 9.17pm, Elliot then uploaded his final video to YouTube, titling it, Elliot Rogers Retribution. One minute later, he then sent his 137-page manifesto to 34 people. This included both of his parents, other family members, his therapist, his former school teachers, and his childhood friends. His therapist contacted his mother within five minutes of the email being sent, and very quickly, she reacted by calling his father Peter, and then the police. Both Peter and Lee Chin raced from their homes in Los Angeles towards Isla Vista, but by then, it was too late. Elliot was already in motion. He headed to the Alpha Phi sorority with intention of shooting everyone inside, but when his knocking on their front door went unanswered, he retreated back from the property towards the street. Instead, Elliot shot three Delta 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 sorority women who were nearby killing Cooper and Veronica Weiss, and wounding Bianca de Kock. He then drove further into town to Pardal Road, before he proceeded on foot and fired several rounds into Ila Vista Deli Mart, killing a student named Christopher Michael Martinez. After killing Christopher, Elliot drove away and continued his rampage, shooting at several pedestrians in drive-by shootings while striking others with his BMW. As he backed onto himself, Elliot got into a gunfight with three responding officers near Little Acorn Park. He suffered a gunshot wound to the left hip before speeding away. He was closely pursued as he fled. Still adamant to cause as much carnage as possible, he crashed into a cyclist. In his rage though, he crashed his BMW, and there was no way to flee. Elliot then fatally shot himself in the head, finally bringing an end to his rampage. Police officers would find Elliot Rogers dead behind his steering wheel only seconds later, and with the cyclist next to him, they would think that both, at first, were suspects. Both of them would be handcuffed, but a few minutes later, the cyclist would be cleared of any suspicion. Police would soon discover three bodies that night, and then another three the next morning. Christopher Martinez, a graduating student at UCSB, was pronounced dead in the Ila Vista Deli. He was described as a really great kid that had a bright future ahead. Katie Cooper and Veronica Weiss were both killed outside Alpha Phi Sorority House. Veronica was a sweet and friendly young woman who loved sports as much as she did her friends. Katie Cooper was known as an unforgettable smart girl. She was studying art history and archaeology. The following morning, police would find the bodies of Wei Han Wang, Cheng Yuan Hong, and George Chen at 6598 Savile Road, number 7. Wei Han Wang was academically gifted in computer programming, and he was looking forward to visiting Yellowstone National Park for his 21st birthday. Cheng Yuan Hong was both smart and kind, known to be always willing to help people out. And George Chen too was sweet-natured a volunteer at an elderly neighbours organisation when he wasn't seeing friends or tutoring other classmates. On the day after the spree, a candlelit memorial was held in honour of the victims. This was followed by a memorial service at UCSB's Harder Stadium, which held over 20,000 people in attendance. 
Elliot Rogers father Peter would then go on to state television to share with the world his anger, despair and confliction. He would then go on to admit that, sometimes, due to the pain Elliot caused, that he wished his son had never been born. Despite the widespread damnation to his actions, Elliot Roger would soon become known as the King of the Incels, a portmanteau of involuntary celibate. Incels are an online subculture of people who define themselves as unable to find a romantic or sexual partner despite desiring one. It is there that Elliot found sympathy and forgiveness for his struggles to both romantically and socially find his place on this earth. But Elliot is better defined as a misogynist, a racist, and a narcissist. He had a strong prejudice against women, clearly spoke against Asian and black people, and described himself to be a god above the rest of mankind. But there were other factors at play here too. He was a man severely struggling with mental illness, something that he had been struggling with for a very long time. And he was also very lonely, not just seeking relationships, but friendship too. With a split family and moving around so often, it's easy to see that both his chances to find companionship and overcome his mental obstacles were thwarted. It's thought of Oking to wonder if this massacre could have been avoided entirely if he had received the correct response in his earlier years. That does not diminish his actions though, what he did is unforgivable, but it does underpin the severe consequences in not addressing mental hardships early on in childhood. And the real tragedy here, the lives of six others lost. All who had no play or part to Elliot's suffering or rage. Elliot's 137 page manifesto is available online by the way, it's kind of made this case pretty easy to research. I'll leave the link if you are interested in it below, but a word of warning, it's pretty exhausting to read. Thank you again for watching another case by Coffeehouse Crime, and as said, just a small announcement to make. I wanted to take a moment to thank you so, so much for supporting me and this channel. When I started Coffeehouse Crime back in January, I had no idea that just four months later would be here on 100,000 subscribers. Honestly, that number is unfathomable to me, and it's quite daunting to think how many people now watch my videos. Nevertheless, I'm really excited to see where this goes in the future, and I really do hope that you stick around to see where this all goes. If you haven't noticed, I am trying a few new lighting techniques, so please bear with me while I try and figure this all out. Yes, this is a new shirt to celebrate, and no, it's not plaid, but I did buy another one just for the occasion, so stick around in future videos to see what that one is. If you did find this video interesting, please give it a thumbs up, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe, it really does help me out. Okay, I'm leaving it there for today folks, but again, thank you. And of course, I'll be waiting right here, behind this camera, for you in the next one. Until then though, take care of each other. Goodbye.